This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome back to Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live from our tropical paradise in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're tuning in today with a very good, for, this, for the topic of this show, a very windy, wintry day here in our paradise. And we're bringing in someone uh, who is actually at another tropics, where it also sort of cooled down, relatively speaking. And that's Da Nang, Vietnam. And we're welcoming uh, David Rockwood. Hi, David. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. And David, if you don't know David, guys, then uh, look up one of the inaugural shows uh, of this sequence here. This is when David introduced himself and his, his work in the field of tropic hearing. And you were showing uh, some, uh, if we can get picture one, you were showing some very impressive uh, work. Um, uh, and we see you at the top right of that image here in front of one of the projects you um, proposed. And you can also see something in, in yellowish and brownish, and these are some screens. But before we get there, maybe you tell us a little about, uh, about the sort of the, the uh, sort of parallelity or duality or schizophrenia of this image here that we see on picture number one, David. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Da Nang, it's uh, it's a it's a beach uh, city. It's about the same population as Honolulu, uh, and so there's uh, a lot of tourist activity. This is a photo on the beach, uh, beautiful beach, and uh, <coughs> the image on the left is a new condominium uh, tower that's being built. Uh, there's a lot of building activity that's happening. Uh, it's really booming. And you can see the difference between the kind of open, uh, uh, kind of grass thatched uh, uh, roof on the right, uh, very open to the environment, and the kind of hermetically uh, glass curtain wall building uh, that's being built on the left. Mm -hmm. And some might say now this reminds us very much of back home, home meaning here, and this is the next picture. Um, where we see a project that um, is by someone from the East Coast, Richard Meyer, where you actually have lived and taught at Pratt Institute for quite a while, and you had to bundle up in the winter and, you know, stay warm. And uh, that's the same where I'm from in Germany, but we came both to Hawaii to not wanting to have that anymore. We got sick of it, right? So we come to Hawaii and expect <laughs> architecture that is different and climatically responsive, but then we get this sort of invasive stuff. And and this is the Gateway Project by Howard Hughes. And at the top right, we did a show with the Soto about what used to be there before and is currently under demolition, yes, which is the they, warehouse. And uh, I'm Yeah, sure it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of phenomenon that's happening. And uh, it's the example we just saw in, in Da Nang, Vietnam. Uh, we're seeing a similar phenomenon in, in Hawaii. Uh, so developers are coming in, they're bringing in uh, designs <coughs> that really don't uh, have too much to do with the place, the people, and the climate. Uh, and so while this is a, a very beautiful building, uh, kind of formally as a work of art, uh, in terms of uh, creating a, a, a really livable environment uh, appropriate for Hawaii, it's probably kind of lacking. Uh, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry I think, to. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, and I'm sorry to to be uh, even more Debbie Downer because I'm taking you home now on the next picture. This is our way to work, which we mostly do in an easy breezy post fossil uh, commuting way, either on two feet or on two wheels. And if we can get the next picture. But when you come back, what we see here, uh, I'm afraid to say, it will be almost completed as the rendering, which I uh, took a picture of at the construction fence at the very top right. And also to make you cry, I put in this picture at the very bottom right, which is a detail of the former building, which was a very nice uh, few story walk up, port in place, uh, external circulation, very nice and easy breezy. And so, uh, Sorry to tell you that, <laughs> but lifting back up our yeah, spirit well, is the. Well, thank you for the. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for the uh, for the update. And uh, yeah, this is a building, and I think uh, we we both kind of share uh, the love of uh, buildings under construction because often um, that's when they're in their kind of most uh, kind of raw and pure state. This particular building is actually uh, post tension concrete, so uh, so it has long spans, so it's very uh, minimal structure uh, and really very beautiful. Uh, but now we're kind of seeing uh, all of this uh, kind of superfluous uh, things coming in, and it's it's very unfortunate to see it all beginning to get all kind of enclosed. But uh, yeah, and uh, therapeutically for you, we bring up the next picture so we don't get more depressed. This is an uplifting picture, at least sort of in our mind, we imagine we could freeze the moment of time and construction, because this is a picture I took from the other side and it portrays sort of your dream of basically inhabiting the skeleton, right, and keeping it easy breezy. It provides everything that you need to stay dry and and basically get no sunburn. That's all you need here because otherwise, um, it's pretty yes. good. And, we, and when we see when we see a building like this, we uh, you know, we kind of think back and, and again we know that uh, people kept buildings more like at this particular state uh, in previous uh, previous times and uh, <clears throat> of course before air conditioning and uh, and they worked. Uh, they worked quite well mm -hmm. uh, if designed properly, uh, mm -hmm. and probably less expensive, uh, and uh, allowed people to feel like they were in Hawaii. So, yeah. uh, all kinds of advantages I think to be had to to really kind of rethink this. Exactly, and um, we're we're not giving up on thinking this should be the case in the future anymore. And if we can get the next picture, which if you guys watch the show. Uh, you've seen us talking about this pro project every now and then. This is the project we're both collaborating on with the emerging generation. It's called Primitiva, and it tries to sort of reintroduce these kind of values. And to the left, you see uh, a suggestion for the fenestration, which is pretty much the absence of it, but there's like a stainless steel fissure net so you don't fall off the building, and there's also vegetation. And that vegetation we've been very critically discussing forever, I can say. And recently, our uh, most activist journalist, Kurt Sandburn, at the bottom right, who did a show with us, uh, was sending me this provocative uh, article uh, about this sort of boom of vegetative towers in, in Italy. And it says, does it also have room for the people? So um, while myself, I'm crazy enough and extreme to say I want to live that way and I don't care because when people say it's cold, I'm saying it's not because where we're from, it is cold. But let's just say there aren't enough people like me and that's probably reasonable to, to question. Then the show today will be about what the solution could be that actually many people, not to say most people, would actually feel comfortable living in these buildings. And uh, to illustrate that and uh, to share the work you've been doing with uh, uh, two generations of emerging architects, we bring up the next picture that gets us to a fellow German of mine, right? Who is that? Yes, uh, this is Gottfried Semper. You can pronounce it better than I can. Or, uh, it's but, perfectly uh, fine. I, I tried my best. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so this is uh, kind of illustrating a, a particularly kind of interesting point in time the year 1863, uh, where a lot of architects uh, in Europe uh, and the West were trying to kind of rediscover the, the uh, kind of essence of architecture. And so he uh, illustrates this uh, Caribbean hut uh, where he's showing the elevated floor, the open frame, the large uh, sheltering roof for protection of sun and rain, and then the kind of porous uh, map screen wall. So those were the kind of four main elements that he said really uh, comprised architecture and, uh, and, and really saw that as a way to kind of uh, get back to essentials. And, uh, and it was a very powerful uh, kind of image at the time. and has kind of come back at certain points in history since then. It's mm -hmm. a kind of reminder about uh, what, what it is that we are really all about. Yeah, and let's look at some of these in the next couple pictures. So the next picture here is an example from the 30s, 1932. And this is Le Corbusier, right? Yes. Yes, Le Corbusier. This is probably...
probably one of his uh, first large kind of commercial uh, building projects. And he was very interested in kind of social issues and also technical issues. And this building is interesting because it's trying to uh, it's essentially kind of social housing, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, what we need also, so desperately uh, here. An early uh, curtain wall. Mm -hmm. Yes. So early curtain wall, and it was actually more technologically advanced than most of our current current uh, curtain walls. It had two layers of glass and then a ventilation system that went between the two panes of glass. <clears throat> that was about value engineered out, unfortunately. <laughs> so the building uh, became an oven. Uh, because of the lack of that, and so it was almost uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, very famous architect he made an experiment. Uh, he wanted to respond kind of technically to have it uh, work properly, but uh, uh, as many things uh, happen, they get value engineered out, and uh, all of a sudden there's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And while we bring up the next picture, we can certainly say he learned it the hot way, right? <laughs> versus the hard way, the hard, hot way, the hot, hard way. And uh, this one here is also bringing DeSoto in in a show we basically did about uh, tropical brutalism we introduced. And the Brie Soleil, as even the term indicates, it comes from French language, you know, is something that is, um, is a device in architecture that helps mitigate you from, from the sun, which is building shows. Uh, and this is in the 50s now. And yes, yes. So, uh, so essentially what, what happened, uh, they, uh, they couldn't re reinstall this uh, ventilation system that was originally proposed. And in the meantime, uh, Corbusier had been experimenting with um, other buildings uh, using what he referred to as the Brie Soleil or the Sunbreak uh, French. And uh, so there's this kind of uh, waffle pattern uh, exterior, which uh, provides shading for that facade. And they also cut down on the glass area, as you can see, with colored panels. Uh, so that was a, a, a retrofit, which was, a, which was uh, to make the building uh, more comfortable thermally. Mm -hmm. And since it's so exciting, but we have something more exciting coming up that we need to make sure we don't fall short on. So we should show one more picture from the past which is actually sort of a hero or a mentor in that field, or two of them, two brothers. And then we're going to show how all that sort of history and legacy that you know, you're aware of, basically, and inspired you to, to do uh, prototyping with your students. So who are these mentors? Oh, thank you, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the two old guy uh, brothers uh, were early kind of uh, people looking at um, in a, in a kind of more scientific way, uh, how we could make buildings uh, more thermally comfortable using uh, kind of passive uh, type techniques. So uh, passive meaning without uh, sort of active uh, mechanical air conditioning and things of that sort. Uh, so this, this book was an early, uh, very pioneering look at uh, how to go about <coughs> go about uh, shading buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then maybe, Mark, you want to talk about, I know this is one of your favorite buildings, about how some of these principles were applied. Yeah, it is. And you guys just watched the other show. We did uh, one about the Alamoana building, the Soda and I, and it's a building that at the same time, mid-century, was doing sort of uh, automated um, uh, shading that sort of adjusted itself to the changing sun. Uh, unfortunately, they got taken off and uh, replaced with something uh, purely formal and, and hideous and non-functional anymore. But, but that is why you basically right. picked up on there uh, and basically said, let's go to the next picture. I think this is, this is the reason. There's a great tradition. There's a great legacy. And this picture is now in the 63. And you basically told your emerging colleagues, hey, guys, let's get back on that. And let's basically test and experiment the next generation of shading devices, if I'm correct. Yes, uh, yeah, we cut out there for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can still hear you. Uh, sorry, connection. You're far away, and uh, so it's, yeah, we're on picture 10 with the with an awesome diagram from 63. <laughs> okay, okay, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I really love this uh, this chart, this diagram. It's, it's kind of scientific, but at the same time, it has this kind of cartoon 
character uh, kind of really showing the, the kind of human side, if you will, of, uh, of what, what constitutes comfort. So it's showing the factors that contribute to uh, comfort, so solar radiation, humidity, temperature, uh, and shading and ventilation. So all those things come together in this diagram, uh, and this, this character here on the lounge chair is uh, kind of right in the sweet spot. So he's in the, in the comfort zone, so it means that uh, it, it's not uh, too hot, but he's got enough ventilation, he's got enough shade, <clears throat> and um, so that's, that's really kind of encapsulates what it is that we kind of then try to do uh, with passive buildings in order to create a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. And let's use the remaining 10 minutes of the show to sort of do a sprint through uh, a, couple, a selection of projects that you sort of did based upon that methodology and theory just the last few couple of semesters here at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And picture number 11 uh, brings up, before we do that, we jump to the 80s. And this is one of your mentors. You had the privilege, as very few architects uh, in the world, to be recognized and highly uh, recommended by this gentleman, Kenneth Frampton. And uh, he was also sort of adding sort of more uh, contextual theory to that subject matter, right? Well, yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you. And he, uh, so this was the height of postmodernism. A lot of historical styles were being kind of used uh, somewhat uncritically, I would say. Um, and he, uh, Frampton really was resisting that. And he wanted something that uh, was more authentic uh, to the people and the place. So this was a kind of a paper that he wrote that was um, very, very influential about uh, getting people to look back at uh, uh, things which may be kind of more authentic and maybe ultimately more uh, meaningful in kind of fuller ways. Mm -hmm. And go to the next, take the next picture. Uh, to basically here now, this is where we start introducing the emerging architects' work under your yeah. supervision and guidance. Okay, thank you. And uh, so I, I did begin to work with uh, students, and so we thought, well, if we're going to be making kind of biochromatic buildings, this interface between inside and outside is is really what the the critical juncture. And uh, and how do we make something which um, which uh, provides the kind of uh, control to provide uh, opportunities, but also uh, provide for comfort. So sort of daylighting and glare, uh, protecting against kind of more extreme sun and heat, uh, providing you know, ventilation, but also protecting against uh, if there's a storm, and uh, uh, allowing views out, but also uh, privacy. Mm -hmm. so, there's a variety of things that the functions that these uh, kind of screens uh, need to to perform in order to uh, to kind of work for a, a variety of different type of people and what their preferences are. Mm -hmm. And now we go to the next slide, which um, shows us the, as it says, okay, the methodology. So, um, basically, uh, are you still there? Yes, I. Um, so I, I proposed a kind of way of working uh, with the students uh, where they first uh, or defined a design space, which is kind of the main sort of parameters. Where is it located? Who are the people it serves? What is the climate? And so forth. And then specific design criteria. So what, uh, what kinds of ways uh, ultimately can you use to help design but also measure your success uh, of your design? then to make multiple schemes to evaluate those, and then uh, ultimately toward the end then begin to uh, actually make physical uh, prototypes, working prototypes, using actual materials and test those to see how well it's working. So that was the overall methodology that we mm -hmm. used uh, when I was working with my students. That worked pretty well, which we will see soon, but if we get the next picture up, we have one more. A picture with uh, some more prerequisites here. Okay, so uh, so this was a first student project, and uh, we'll just show a couple of images of, of a few different projects. Uh, you can see the students' names on the lower left there to give them credit. Uh, and uh, so you can see at the bottom, individual control, variable shade and ventilation, simple 
construction operation. So that's the, the probably the, the most uh, succinct uh, kind of synopsis of of what they were trying to achieve with this uh, particular uh, design. Mm -hmm. We would just jump because we're running out of time. Just jump right in how that would look like the result of that, which is the next picture, which is also a permanent background. Whenever you see <laughs> us, we have that in the back of us. Right. So you can see it basically folds up uh, vertically and then it has within the sections operable louvers. So it gives it a lot of, you can open it all the way up and, and you can vary mm -hmm. uh, privacy ventilation and so forth. But different than mostly in school where you're happy when you get a pretty picture, you were holding them accountable on actually making this work. And let's get to the next uh, picture, which shows us details of that, um, of that laboratory-like um, environment that you created with them, where they, they tried and failed, and they tried and failed, just like your Corbusier, right? He was allowed, and maybe he needed to fail to yeah, ultimately be successful, right? Exactly, yeah, the, the operation of yeah, the operation of this was very tricky, and uh, things needed to be precise. It jammed a lot. Uh, there were different clearance issues. Uh, they had to try different bearings and all kinds of things. Uh, so they went round and round uh, through multiple iterations to finally fit uh, all the different conditions to, mm -hmm. to work so that it operated smoothly. Yeah. But they made it work, as you can see on the next picture, and I've seen it, I witnessed it in, in operative mode, and it's rather poetic. It's kinetic, and it's performative, yeah. and it's formal, and it's, it's all of that and more. Yeah. Yeah, th yeah, thank you, Mark. Yeah, it actually works very smoothly, and it all is kind of a coordinated motion, so it's, a, it's really kind of interesting to see it kind of uh, unfold. Mm -hmm. And let's go, um, we got only three minutes left, so we're going to run through, probably we show maybe um, uh, one picture after another, and we just, you just talk while following the flow of the pictures. So if we can get the, the next couple okay. of pictures up just for a couple of maybe seconds, and then just keep on going, and you just sort of tell us the quintessence of what we see while we, uh, yeah, have the, the okay. images walk by. <laughs> okay, so... So this first screen is the team's uh, way of kind of breaking down and, uh, and showing the different uh, aspects of the design that would help to guide them later. Yeah. The next, uh, are you on the next one? Uh, yeah, we're actually, so this we, was the, mm -hmm. keep going. Okay, this was their first, yeah, this was, this was their first design, uh, which was basically a, a vertical uh, fabric louver, which is operable. And uh, they, they had the idea you could pivot at the top and the bottom, which would give certain kinds of, uh, they were arguing, some advantages. Mm -hmm. And the next slide then shows a, a kind of computer simulation showing some different configurations. So you can see how they're pivoting the fabric uh, louvers at the top and the bottom so that it gets this kind of hourglass sort of shape. Uh, and it varies then the light condition or the wind conditions as it enters the interior. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And number 20 second shows sort of not the final, but I guess the ultimate uh, sort of um, um, prototyping or the, the mock-up as we, as we call these things. And we only have two minutes left of the show, so we got to just have walk from 23 to uh, 27, which is another project with students taking another take, which was a vegetated one. So here comes the green again, Martin. So Martin is happy, but it comes in a very sort of different way that the planters had to be designed and prototyped, right? And it's sort of a mesh out yes. of big uh, planters and troughs suspended. Yes. Yeah, so uh, they essentially have these planters that are uh, hung on the cables and they could be reconfigured in different patterns uh, according to how much shading or how many plants or how much privacy and so forth that you wanted. So they, they did some interesting mold making in order to do this and uh, I think it was very uh, very interesting project. Mm -hmm. So we have one last project, which is 29 to 30, uh, which I put in because you had done then the following semester which also had great, there are too many to show, and if you guys are around, they're still in the architecture school uh, to check them out. But this one here is a rather fascinating too, because it's 
sort of almost going back to the first project, but in a different way, saying sometimes you want to have it all open. This is the Martin way, right? But sometimes you want to have it all closed, and then you want it incrementally stages in between for these all different other people at different times. And this is what this system fabulously yeah, sort of this, demonstrates. This, this, this team, yeah, uh, this team was interesting. They had a, a whole variety of, of quite different schemes, and they then seized upon one at the end and pushed it really hard. Uh, and it's essentially like, uh, like a window blind, uh, except the, this one is anchored so it won't flap in the wind. Uh, and it's larger in scale, so it's a little bit heavier duty. Uh, and uh, you can use it as an actual, uh, more or less as a replacement for a window rather than something that covers on the interior of a window. Uh, but it was very complicated, uh, and they worked very hard to get all the mechanisms and so forth uh, to operate well, and did a, uh, really, I think, a very impressive job with it. Absolutely. I can confirm that. And we're at the end of the show, but the next picture of 32 <laughs> is like we go back home, maybe up from, Don from school, and uh, no, 32 we need again. Um, we uh, and we go down, and while we would hate to see one of our sort of great Brie Soleil, uh, uh, you know, uh, artifacts by Pete Wimberly go, which is the varsity building at the bottom right, some of our team members gave us sort of a little uh, inner scoop uh, message from the development team uh, of, of this area that it might have to go, and we said, hopefully when Pete would turn around in his grave to see his masterpiece go, maybe he would be a little bit less upset if we would see another circle that hopefully makes sense uh, would be there. And this is why we suggested Primitiva to be there. But after you talk, uh, David, Primitiva yeah. wouldn't just work for me. It would work for the Beatles and for you and for many other people, because the screen seems to me a really necessary thing um, and, and a really exciting way of the, the multitude. And you were just like basically starting and there's like tons of other options are possible, right? Yeah, I think this is uh, something that can really uh, is interesting, continue to develop and, and I think it can play an important role sort of in the future as we kind of think about more uh, kind of sustainable and kind of bio bioclimatic uh, strategies for uh, for really living in the tropics. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, it's an exciting uh, thing to be working on. And that being said, the next picture, uh, we thank you for uh, having been with us uh, from far away, but your heart's still here and also your sensitivity for the tropics. And uh, this is you uh, talking about that subject matter to some of your students. And I subtitled this the uh, Saigon screening, but you actually, you have been in Saigon recently and you're going up to Hanoi, so you're all over the place in, in Vietnam as well. And so uh, we uh, can't wait to have you back, David, uh, to uh, apply everything you learned and you taught over there back home. And until then, please keep up the excellent tropic hearing. Well, well, thank you so much, Martin, and, uh, and, and same to you. And Thank you again for uh, for having me on the show. All right. Thank you very much. All right. And, uh, okay. Thank you. See you guys all next week for another episode with DeSoto Brown. We're going to do the volume two version, uh, which is called uh, Volcanic um, Veneer and Ventilation. So stay, stay tuned for that. And until then, hopefully you guys start Tropic Hearing as well. Bye-bye.